the one on the, who sat on the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. What does it mean to proclaim Mary as the new Eve? Since the second century, writers proclaimed through the death, or, or death through Eve, life through Mary. In the third chapter of the book of Genesis, we have the tradition that has become to know as the Proto-Evangelium, or the first gospel, where God responds to the servant, hinting at his first promise of redemption after the fall of Adam and Eve. I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your seed and her seed. She shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. All this hints at a cosmic struggle that will follow, resulting in the serpent's ultimate defeat through the seed of the woman. Through her seed will also suffer through this victory. You shall bruise his heel. The Christian tradition sees this ultimately as a, a, a cryptic prophecy of Jesus' victory over the devil on the cross. Further, in the third chapter of the book of Genesis, Eve is also described as the mother of all the living. Through grace, in Christ, Mary becomes now our mother. She becomes the mother of all the living, not in the order of nature, but in the order of supernatural grace. Eve was created in a state of grace without sin. If Mary is to exhibit this total enmity between her and the serpent, as mentioned in the book of Genesis, it would seem that her grace state must rise at least to the level of Eve. Here we can see a hint of Mary's immaculate conception. This is not a doctrine implying that Mary does not need a saviour, but rather one referring to the unique and special way in which she is saved by her son. Now most of us are drowning in our own sin, and Jesus pulls us out. The Immaculate Conception means that Jesus saved her before she fell into sin. So what is the biblical evidence for seeing Mary as this new Eve? For the most part, it comes from the writings of St. John. Likely, not as a coincidence, since he was the one who took our Blessed Lady in after Jesus' death. Surely we might ask that St. John must have spoken with our Blessed Mother about what Jesus was like when he was just young. In other words, it's not an accident that St. John's writings give us some of the most exalted theological writing in the New Testament. After all, he was able to contemplate these mysteries with our Blessed Lady by his side. Let's begin with the Gospel. John opens with clear allusions to the book of Genesis. In the beginning was the Word. John continues to refer to life and to light. Again, clear allusions to the story of creation in the book of Genesis. And if we follow the text carefully, John then proceeds to lay out a series of days using the recurring phrase, the next day. And he does this actually three times, suggesting a series of days. The first next day would be the second day, then the third, and then the fourth. In this context, we have a marriage which is said to take place on the third day. Well, the third day we might ask from what? Perhaps from the fourth day, in which case the third day would be the seventh day. In other words, especially in the light of the way 
St. John began his gospel with clear allusions to the book of Genesis. He seems here to be subtly setting up a new creation week. This is the setting for Jesus' reply to Mary at Cana in Galilee. Woman, my hour has not yet come. Despite the way it sounds to our ears, this is not a dis disrespectful rebuke for a couple of reasons. Firstly, Jesus is the God-man. Surely he's not breaking the fourth commandment here. Secondly, Mary's response is itself indicative. She does not cower away saying, Jesus, do not have to be so mean in public with me. Rather, our Blessed Lady turns directly to the servant saying, do whatever he tells you. In other words, Mary's response suggests an enthusiastic eagerness, as if she's joyfully saying, Jesus is going to help us. Well, if Jesus is not giving Mary a rebuke, then what is he doing? And why does St. John recount the narrative the way he does? Given the Genesis allusions with which John began his gospel, and then the subtle creation week he develops by recourse to the phrase, the next day and then the third day, it seems that there may be a certain woman in my mind to which Jesus is alluding. I will put enmity between you and the woman. In other words, Jesus is proclaiming Mary to be the new Eve, the woman who bears the seed, who brings about the ultimate victory. In fact, John never refers to Mary by name. Rather, he always refers to her as woman. On the cross in, Jesus, in John's Gospel, Jesus looks down and sees his mother and John the beloved's disciple. And Jesus says, woman, behold your son. Behold your mother. Here John takes Mary as his spiritual mother, and Mary takes John as her spiritual son. You might also ask, why does John call himself the beloved disciple? Well, are you beloved? Am I beloved? John here sees himself as embodying the relationship granted to all disciples. His taking Mary as his spiritual mother refers not just to him, but to the relationship of all Christians, that all Christians now have with our Blessed Lady. In entrusting John and Mary to each other in this way, Jesus has entrusted the Blessed Mother to all of us. Mary becomes our spiritual mother, who constantly brings our needs to her son, just as she did at the wedding at Cana. And she continually says to all of us, just as she did then, do whatever he tells you. In other words, Mary always takes us to Jesus. The closer we get to her, the closer we get to him. We have similar images in the book of Revelation, where we have a woman who is both the mother of the Messiah and the mother of all Christians. Her other children are described as those who keep the commandments of God and bear testimony to Jesus. The early church knew that Mary was the new Eve, the new mother of all the living, and therefore our mother in Christ. As the early church fathers like to say, Mary is like the moon. She has no light of herself, but she radiantly reflects the light of the sun. This analogy is actually very important because it shows us that Mary's glory is always a participation in that of her son. That is, it's never in competition with Jesus. It never takes away from Jesus, but only serves to show his power. 
Both Eve and Mary were approached by an angel. With Eve, we can imagine a fallen angel. Doubt crept into Eve's heart, whereas Mary's faith was steadfast. Eve participated in the downfall of the first Adam, just as Mary participates in the victory of her son, the new Adam. In the words of the early fathers again, the knot of Eve's disobedience was untied by Mary's faith. In God's providence, it was Mary's feared, her yes, that prepared the way for the new creation made manifest in Christ's resurrection. Her yes in one of her great titles became the cause of our salvation. Mary's yes, Mary's fiat, became humanity's yes to the great divine wedding, the wedding proposal, a wedding between humanity and God again. So very simply today, we might just ask a question. How can we get closer to Mary and thereby draw closer to her son? For Mary's deepest desire is to unite us to her son. So praise be Jesus Christ. On the day before he was to suffer, he took bread in his holy and venerable hands, and with eyes raised to heaven, to you, O God, his almighty Father, giving you thanks, he said the blessing, broke the bread, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and eat of it. For this is my body, which will be given up for you. In a similar way, when supper was ended, he took this precious chalice in his holy and venerable hands, and once more giving you thanks, he said the blessing, and gave the chalice to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and drink from it, for this is the chalice of my blood, the blood of the new and eternal covenant, which will be poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in memory of me. 